history is where you come from who you are and how did you arrive at where you are today anybody who doesn't know history doesn't know who he is and where he comes from some might say i don't care history really doesn't affect me i am someone who's interested in earning my livelihood having a good life a good wife and get out of the place sure fantastic you can abandon your identity but when you exercise that free will you realize that it is a decision that only you have taken but somebody who continues to associate that identity with you will never let go of that unless and until the truth is ironed out it is thrashed out it is discussed it is debated and presented with honesty there is no question of lasting peace you will continue to brush truth and facts and history under the carpet but the more you try and do it kuda to wahan pe jama hota rahega and kisi din sabko nazar aa hi jayega it is important to recontextualize history and take it from the hands of those people who are intent in propagating a defeatist mindset we are fighting on complexion we are fighting on who is an aryan and who is a dravidian when there is a decent chance that as opposed to the aryan invasion theory you should be looking at out of india theory that people left this place and went outside i am someone who sees a lot of value in reading the subject in understanding history and its relevance on a day to day basis so it makes sense for someone like me who loves the subject to read about it to understand its value but why should everybody read history what is the point how does history help you on a day to day basis does it help you get a job i don't think so i'm not sure if someone wants to simply look at a subject from a utilitarian standpoint which is isse kitna paisa ban sakta hai let's ask that straight blunt question history is perhaps the last as far as the list of priorities go is it possible for you to crudely equate history with identity is it possible to say that history is where you come from who you are and how did you arrive at where you are today right it's possible now why is history relevant today for academics and people who love history as a subject you don't need to give them a specific incentive or a reason to love the subject they automatically they are drawn to the subject lekin jinko history pasand nahi hai ya usme ruchi nahi hai how are you going to attract them i'll make it very relevant to you right from reservations right from the two nation theory right from the aryan invasion theory ki bharat ke log kahan ke hain all these have now become relevant in the discourse of this country in its day to day national discourse tell me one aspect of indian politics which is free of identity politics today language is an issue sect is an issue religion is an issue caste is an issue water is an issue everything is an issue and it all boils down to identity if it all boils down to identity how is it possible that history doesn't find enough traction history plays a huge role when people in the 1917 to 1970s were hounded out of tamil nadu history was used to hound them out on the basis of the aryan invasion theory saying some castes are people who have come from the north and these are the remnants of the aryans they are not dravidians they are not true dravidians kick them out when gujarat was formed it was previously part of the bombay presidency when gujarat was carved out of bombay presidency it was based on a certain identity when telangana was split for andhra pradesh it is based on a certain identity it's not economics it's not always economics economics does play a certain role but beyond that it is a question of identity therefore as far as i'm concerned anybody who doesn't know history doesn't know who he is and where he comes from he is a person who is rootless he is a person who is deracinated but some might say i don't care history really doesn't affect me i am someone who's interested in earning my livelihood having a good life a good wife and get out of the place that's it i am not interested in anything else sure fantastic you can abandon your identity you have the choice of abandoning your identity but when you exercise that free will you realize that it is a decision that only you have taken but somebody who continues to associate that identity with you will never let go of that as long as that identity continues to stick to your soul to your body he will continue to have a problem with that identity even if you let go of that identity you can say i have a problem with a certain community or a certain community has a problem with me i might as well leave this place and go to some place else i'll go and settle perhaps in vancouver 
or in the United States of America, in the golden pastures of California, wherever you want to go, you go. But the fact that you are a certain person and you come from a certain background will continue to haunt you unless and until you convert or you change. Therefore, anybody who devalues identity, according to me, has simply not understood the value of history. The Communist Party of China, for all practical purposes, subscribes to the Marxist ideology and then the next version, which is the Maoist ideology. And therefore, according to them, they believe in the class war. According to them, there is the oppressed and there are the oppressors. This is the only two camps in which the world is divided. And therefore, for the next 30, 40 years, they went about destroying every symbol of Chinese culture under all sorts of names, the Great Leap, the Long Revolution, this and that, they kept on doing it. But today, they've decided that the vision of China, the vision of the Middle Kingdom is central in order for them to build a grand narrative if they have to plan the next 100 years. So, an avowedly communist regime, which is not supposed to have any belief in culture and which rejects the idea of history altogether, has realized the value of history. So, no matter what you do, History is a subject that you can't run away from. So that's point number one. Point number two, Sir mentioned that we must forget all our differences and divisions and we must think as Indians. I will make a bold and perhaps a politically incorrect statement. Satya ki bina shanti to sulab nahi hai, nahi mumkin hai. Unless and until the truth is ironed out, it is thrashed out, it is discussed, it is debated and presented with honesty, there is no question of lasting peace. You will continue to brush truth and facts and history under the carpet. But the more you try and do it, kuda to pe jama hota rahega, and kisi din sabko nazar aahi jayega. The more you try to suppress a spring, the more it is, it is bound to rebound. Therefore, it is important to face reality, to accept reality, to accept a few facts. Because only then you will come to a common ground. You will come to the same page. And only when you come to the same page, it is possible for you to have a discussion on yahan se aage kahan jana hai, kaise badna hai. But until you arrive at the consensus, there is no question of you thinking of a common shared vision. There are multiple ideas of India as far as this country is concerned for the simple reason that history has become the most contested battleground through political ideologies. Which is why it is important for us to recontextualize Indian history. Have you ever heard of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of the South African government, which was set up after Nelson Mandela came to power? What is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission? Hota kya hai? Before Dr. Mandela came to power, it was a white minority which was ruling the country, just like it was in Zimbabwe before Robert Mugabe came to power. Subsequently, they lost power and they gave way to the ANC, the African National Congress. Now, the African National Congress decided that you can't kick these people out. They have lived here for generations and we have to coexist. But there is such deep hatred and mistrust between the white community and the African community that it is impossible for them to sit in a room and have a civilized dialogue. So they decided, unko mujhe gali dena hai aur mujhe inko gali dena hai. Kyo na ek room mein baith ke ek kar le aur aage badhe. Decide karein ki aage karna kya hai. So, which is why they decided to constitute the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. Why? It is important for history to be documented where all the barbarism and all the cruelty that the African community was subjected to by the white minority was acknowledged. It was accepted. And at least by way, way of a token reparation, Harjana Bharna Pada, that people who have benefited out of this slavery and people who have benefited out of this oppression must pay a certain price for what they have done to others as a token apology. That's the very argument that Mr. Shashi Tharoor is making to the United Kingdom when it comes to reparations to India. He says it's not a question of quantum, it's not a question of quantity, it is a question of principle. Let's put it in Indian context. Assume that there is a certain community which came part of the invasion horde which came to India a thousand years ago, let's say in 700 AD when Sindh was invaded for the very first time. Can you hold the son or the grandson or the prapotra responsible for what the grandfather did? It's impossible, you can't hold him responsible. He was not there, he did not play a role, his free will did not play a role. Therefore, you can't hold people who live in the present responsible for the actions of their ancestors. 
ये बात जो है बहुत जगहों पे लागू होती है चाहे अब हिंदू कास्ट की बात करें या फिर बा, बाकी कम्युनिटीज की बात करें इट अप्लाइज बोथ वेस देर फोर इफ यू कांट किक दीज पीपल आउट एंड इट इज इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर एस टू टॉक अबाउट लिविंग टूगेदर the only way for us is to agree that you did this to me this was wrong problem as far as india is concerned is truth and reconciliation have never been part of our historical discourse they have never been part of our history textbooks they have never been part of our historical curricula because we have tried to brush under the carpet everything that has happened since 700 ad we have tried to brush under the carpet the reality because we are scared of it There could be a good reason. People might say, अगर आप पास्ट की इतनी बात करना शुरू करेंगे और आप खोदने लगेंगे कि इतने लोग मारे गए इतने लोगों का बलात्कार हुआ इतने लोग बंदी बनाए गए सो मेनी पीपल वेर मेड स्लेव एंड दे वेर ड्रैक्ड अक्रॉस द हिंदू कुश यू से ऑल ऑफ दीज थिंग्स इट माइट इन साइट वायलेंस देर फोर पर हैप्स द बेस्ट थिंग टू डू इज टू ब्रश इट ऑन द कार्पेट एंड बिहेव एज इफ इट डजेंट एग्जिस्ट इन द लास्ट सेवेंटी ईयर्स ever since we decided that perhaps the best way to deal with the situation is create a separate country and establish a separate country has this proven to be a success i don't think so every few years there is a problem every few years allegations are hurled against each other every few years we go back to what happened 1200 years ago so to behave as if history is not relevant and has not mattered is stupidity that is the behavior of an ostrich therefore it is important to recontextualize history it is important to recontextualize history and take it from the hands of those people who are intent in propagating a defeatist mindset i'll give this uh, a different twist altogether if you read history textbooks on a regular basis all you hear and all you read is for the last 2000 years or at least 1200 years india's history has been nothing short of a monstrous defeat after defeat in the face of invasions that is the only thing that you read and when a child reads this over and over again let's say from the 5th standard to the 12th standard or the 10th standard that means in his formative years he is being told that he is part of a defeated nation of a defeated community and when that happens it is bound to affect a sense of self esteem it reflects in your body language it reflects in your approach to everything nobody wants to be told in this country despite all these barbaric invasions despite all the monumental and wholesale destruction and genocide that was meted out to the people native to this country we are still here greek history abhi sirf kitabon mein hai the original greek history roman history is only in books you've heard of this place called constantinople in history what is it known as today istanbul what is known as the the royal mosque in turkey was previously the hagia sophia church you don't have a trace of african traditions and pagan roots so i had the opportunity to go to latvia lithuania and estonia of all the places that i chose for a vacation i chose these three countries the baltic countries for the simple reason that if you go to that place aapko hindi kaano mein sunai padega sanskrit aapko sunai padega because one of the closest languages to sanskrit is lithuanian what is the connection does it prove that we are all actually the santan of invaders the aryans or does it prove that log yahan se bhar gaye the so we are fighting on complexion we are fighting on who is an aryan and who is a dravidian when there is a decent chance that as opposed to the aryan invasion theory you should be looking at out of india theory that people left this place and went outside why is this important because people are asking for a dravidian order today people are saying that four states in the south or five states in the south should form a separate country because they form part of the dravidian language and the dravidian culture and they are not part of the larger indian culture that is the extent to which history is being used to drive a wedge between people people who are saying that we may speak different languages vesh bhusha alag ho sakta hai everything can be different but there is a common sutra that ties all of us are being branded as right wingers as fascists as people who are intent on thopifying one culture on everybody else and those people who are saying aap sab alag ho aap ek dusre ke sath baat hi nahi kar sakte hain and people who are giving let's say food and water to separatist ideologies 
are being pushed as people with a liberal bent of mind so if anybody says that history has does not play a role in any of these discussions i'm sorry i would genuinely call him a stupid fellow because he is blind to what is happening right in front of him telangana's telugu dialect is slightly different from andhra's telugu dialect in fact it's vastly different for the simple region that what you know as telangana today was under the rule of the nizam for the longest of time and the nizam was a representative of the moguls in the dakkan dakkan is crudely put dakshin which is what has become dakkan and therefore deccan so thanks to that and hyderabad at that point of time if you read you should read uh, this beautiful book called the last nizam was a melting pot of yemenis of arabs of rohila pathans of turkis and people from all over the middle east and the central asian countries in that particular place as a consequence the telugu language in that particular part of the country is vastly different from the coastal andhra areas the coastal andhra has managed to retain the purity of its language whereas this has taken a lot of influence from outside so you can call the telangana telugu as an upper branch to put it in hindi of the actual form of telugu now we are being told that this telangana telugu is proof of the fact that there were two different communities all together and racial justifications are being created for why telangana was always a separate entity historically from andhra this is how history is being used you want to know more about history please read as to what is happening to the demographics in the northeast thanks to illegal immigration it will only tell you that over a point of time a free living space will be created where the ratio and the demographic balance will be inverted all together and after a point of time the third wave of separatism and the third round of partition will start in this country therefore recontextualizing history is not a discussion that is meant for the educated elite sitting in air conditioned rooms having wine or tea it is meant for everyone to have a say in because it is bound to affect you on a regular basis the idea of india has already undergone a grotesque change in the last 15 to 20 years and it is undergoing an even more grotesque change right in front of our eyes on a daily basis we are now being told that kashmir had nothing to do with indian culture at all that the history of kashmir and the language of kashmir the culture of kashmir was always different and alien to that of india so the sharda peet had apparently nothing to do with india at all so much so that the kashmiri language is out on its way from kashmir and it is being replaced by the national language of pakistan and the national language of pakistan is not even arabic it's urdu <laughs> it's funny the central message that i am trying to put forth is kindly do not leave discussions on history only to the scholars or only to the experts or only to those who are in the business of influencing news or in creating news you have a say in it i don't know of this campus but if you go to college campuses in tamil nadu or you go to college campuses in west bengal history plays an important role in isolation of people in segregation of people and in targeting of people based on language caste and what not it starts at that level and it will continue to the topmost level if you look at cbse textbooks cbse textbooks start only from 1 ce or 1 ad as if india did not have an existence before that it repeats the same nonsense which westerners have thrust on us aryans from central asia came on horseback 2500 years ago and they invaded the indus valley civilization and the harappan civilization and what you know as india today is the product of that rape that butchery that savagery and that invasion this is the nonsense that's being peddled so if the government of india endorses this kind of untruth and this kind of historical distortion foreigners are bound to latch on to it those who are interested in driving a wedge between indians will certainly latch on latch on to it the next thing they'll say is that the devanagari script is completely different from the script of the south and since there is no bar on the top it shows how fundamentally different we are as people therefore a bar on the top of letters will decide that you and i are different entirely that's going to decide the history of this country lack of historical sense and lack of identity is the reason that today europe does not have an answer to the troubles that are facing it 
there is a decent chance that 70% of the people in this audience might say, all I am interested is in Vikas and development and nothing else. All I am interested in is in increasing the livelihood and the standard of living of the people and that's all. Europe has done it. Europe did it several years ago. But they don't have an answer to the identity crisis facing them today. In ke paas jawab nahi hai ki isko kya kare, is immigration ke saath kaise deal kare? Because they don't know who they are. Because they think it is wrong on their part to say that we are Europeans of a different heritage altogether. That we subscribe to a different set of values. They feel ashamed about professing their different values because it has become politically incorrect. What passes off as secularism in this country is called multiculturalism in Europe and United Kingdom. These are basically two different names of the same animal, the same jantu, the same creature, which is political correctness, which is meant to brush aside facts, suppress facts, relegated to the dustbin of history at the expense of history and at a huge cost to people. Development is important. Nobody doubts it. For the person on the street who struggles for two square meals a day, history gaya kude mein. Because what he bothers about and what he cares about and what he should be bothered about is his livelihood on a daily basis. There is no doubting it. But then, here's the funny part. You go to any five-star or seven-star hotel in Delhi, you'll find six and a half feet tall, broad Sardar standing as the guard at the door. And then a white tourist decides to enter the place. You see a marked difference in his behavior immediately wherein he bows down this namaste and we treat this as Indian culture, this is our hospitality. Put yourself in the same shoes, which European hotel or American hotel you've been to, where you get the same treatment from their bartenders and their waiters. The problem is, servility has become synonymous with service mentality. These are two different things. Being hospitable is not the same as becoming a slave to somebody else. But unfortunately, if you're repeatedly told, that for generations together, you have been slaves, you will continue to be slaves. Your entire value system is a bunch of humbug and a load of superstition. You are bound to think of yourself as people who deserve to be treated like slaves. Have you heard of any incidents against Arabs in Australia? Can an Arab student be killed the way an Indian student is killed in Australia? I don't think so. Because... They believe, one, sorry, there will be repercussions if you touch them. That's one. Two, Indians hai. Humility is our central identity. That's our central feature. Humility, according to me, is the most misunderstood trait as far as Indian history is concerned. Humility simply means there could be someone better than me and recognizing the fact that there could be someone superior to me. But that does not translate to accepting that I'm inferior to everybody else. That is the definition of humility as far as India is concerned and that repeats itself on a regular basis in the manner in which Indian history is projected. Do you know of the number of expansionist, let's say, wars or campaigns undertaken by the Cholas in the Southeast Asia? How many Chola kings are we aware of? Are we aware of the fact that it took five different armies of five different Sultanates to destroy the Vijayanagara Empire, that it was an unequal war and the rampage of Hampi went on for six months? It took several months for people to destroy one civilization or one empire. But all we hear is a tomb which is built for somebody's second or third wife. And I suspect he had a wife after that. And one of his daughters also performed the role of a wife later. This is a fact. When Shah Jahan was imprisoned along with his daughter by Aurangzeb, there are written records which clearly say that his daughter effectively had to take up the role or the, don the mantle of a wife. And yet, that tomb is supposed to be the symbol of his love for his wife. Great. Accepted. Is there nothing else worth showcasing in India? If you go to any country, even in America, the earliest that they can show is a structure running for about 300 or 400 years. 300, 400 years, I think there will be a temple in a village in this country, in every village. Most temples, at least in the south, are at least 2,500 years old or 2,000 years old. The reason why I have to talk about the south is most temples of the north. I've effectively, how do I put it? Which anyway, we can't talk about. It would be extremely uh, politically incorrect. It could hurt a lot of sentiments. It could hurt so many sentiments that I will find a lot of death threats and hate mails coming to me the next day. So I'd rather not talk about it. But then, if you really want to read about it, please read Sri Sitaram Goel's book. 
what happened to Hindu temples. He gives a detailed exposition of destruction by destruction, the number of temples that were destroyed. Read the books of Dharampal. Read the books of Sri Konrad Elst. Read the books of David Frawley. Read the books of Michel Danino. Read Max Müller. Max Müller is supposed to be the one who started the Aryan invasion theory. But then if you read his books and his teachings, in fact, there is a beautiful book. It's a short book that you get on Kindle. India, what it can teach us. Just read it. It's barely 80 to 100 pages. A brilliant exposition of how he believes that there is not a single thought in the world that has not been thought of in India. And something that does not exist in India cannot exist elsewhere. That is a German saying. Not that a German saying makes it great, but then since we are fans of people who come out of India, I might as well put it that way. It has to make a difference. I wish I were a skin tone lighter. My statement would perhaps carry more weight. So, to cut a long story short, recontextualizing history is not about knowing certain facts, certain dates. It is first of all about understanding the value of history and then focusing on the facts. If the mind is not a fertile ground to receive facts because it does not see the value in receiving those facts, you facts bharte jaiye, usse kya farak padega? Jab tak perception or attitude mein koi change nahi hoga, satya ka uspe koi asar nahi hoga, koi prabhav nahi padega.